My true calling to medicine didn't come till after my traumatic moment. Lying by the side of the road, no medical care within Kui. I was just alone and in a lot of trouble. Struggling to breathe and, and thinking, probably, probably gonna die. There's a lot of thoughts running through your mind, but at that particular moment, everything's crystallised, everything's clear. If I did get through this, it would be only thanks to the amazing medical service that we have in Australia, and if I can, I, yeah, I want to be part of this too. It was clear to me that medicine was my calling, and it was only at this point in my life that I thought it was about to end. This is right. This is you. To be able to do for others what has saved your life is a particularly special and amazing feeling. So, yeah, here I am. My story's more than just about me and my epiphany. It's closely knitted together with uh, that of an Indigenous man, Manuel, who I crossed paths with uh, just before the accident. How often do you throw him? Well, maybe I'll give it three or four minutes, five, and then I throw him again, yes. We both had these simultaneous uh, brushes with death, these, these life crises and we've both turned our lives around significantly since. Oh, I was going well. <laughs> this way, straight up that way. Now, today, like, you know, I'm, I'm different. Look like I'm a new man now. I got, I got my life back. I don't know how we survived, me and Tim, you know, I don't know how, you know? It wasn't ever spoken about, you will be a doctor. You just fall into the path that your parents have taken sometimes. Dad was a doctor, mum was a nurse, uh, my grandmother was a nurse, my auntie was a nurse. So medicine was sort of there in the family. I was a country general practitioner working in uh, Euroa. And the kids would uh, often come with me uh, while I did the ward rounds, usually annoying the nurses, uh, running up and down the corridors. Growing up in the country was just beautiful. And I got a, an idea for what a difference being a doctor in a, in a rural community could make. I did six years of medicine, then a year internship, and another year of residency. I love helping people, but I found it very constricting being in these big concrete blocks and a very conservative, scientific way of thinking. You can't really be creative and always be yourself. And yeah, I, I was afraid is this my life or am I living someone else's life? I realised that my heart was telling me to become a filmmaker. And I finished my last rotation and I went to the VCA and studied filmmaking with an idea to becoming the next Bruce Beresford. That year was like I'd taken a load off for the first time in a long time, I was just able to do what I wanted. Tim wasn't quite sure what he was going to do next, but the reality was that he had to support himself, so he couldn't just leave and start making films or writing scripts. I was 28, I was stone broke and uh, desperately needed some, some real income and I saw this job in medicine in Catherine in the Northern Territory, and I thought, here's a great adventure and an opportunity to do one last piece of good as a doctor. In 2009, when Tim was here, he was like a lot of young doctors that we do get here. Without experience behind you, can easily get thrown. I was only two years out of medicine. 
and I'd just had the last year basically studying filmmaking. So I wasn't really prepared for um, a job in a remote community in the, the far reaches of the Northern Territory. Within two weeks or so of Tim arriving, a local man by the name of Manuel presented with chest pain. He was clearly unwell, slightly intoxicated, but had quite bad chest and abdominal pain. So I brought him into the, the resus bay immediately and uh, started the assessment. Your oxygen levels just a little bit low, but your breathing's good, OK? You know, I'm from central Arnhem land, and the place called from language, Bear and I first saw a white person, I thought it was a ghost. I didn't drink nothing until when I moved into town. That's when I started drinking. Me and my wife wished to sleep anyway, under the bridge or in a park somewhere, you know. And then when the ball shop opened, we used to buy alcohol. One day, I was very, very sick. I looked at his numbers, and I can remember them now. He was saturating at 90%. He was hypotensive, so really low blood pressure. His heart rate was up, 115. Um, he was sick. <laughs> but the main thing I remember um, was this big smile. Tim said to the nurses, you know, he, he said, look, Manuel is very, very sick. We've got to help him. Once I listened to his chest on the left side, I couldn't hear any breath sounds and got a chest X-ray, showed a complete whiteout of, of that side of the chest. So it was apparent that he needed a chest drain. With my inexperience, it was very daunting. That was the second chest drain I'd ever done. I was putting a big tube directed straight at the heart into someone's chest through their ribs. Once this chest tube went in, all this gunk came out. That's sort of unusual. My first thought, have I put this through the diaphragm, into the bowel? Oh, no. But this gunk was actually in the chest. And I became uh, concerned that he'd ruptured his esophagus and he was vomiting into his chest, which is a very serious medical condition uh, called Boerhaave syndrome. They are so rare. I'd never seen it anywhere other than a textbook. Manuel's condition was more than the hospital was equipped to handle, and he did need referral to a tertiary hospital like Royal Darwin Hospital. We couldn't do that. Our airport was not rated for night flying. There was a lot of frustration in the hospital. For about three years, we couldn't do nighttime retrievals because we had a wallaby problem on the airstrip, and it was deemed unsafe. They would come out at dusk and overnight, so retrieval aeroplanes couldn't land in Catherine after dark. The alternative to that being a $30,000 charter helicopter. With that in mind, Darwin Hospital said to me, oh, it's very rare, what's the CT show? I said, well, there's no CT here. And I couldn't prove this really rare diagnosis without a CT scan. They're like, oh, look, we'll send a plane tomorrow. If someone's left untreated for 24 hours, um, the mortality can near almost 100%. You're dealing with a very sick patient that can go downhill very fast with limited support, so I think fear would have been one of the first things that crossed his mind. Something like this would never happen in the city. The treatment you need, you get, and you get it really fast. So I was, I was in a desperate state of, of, of anger and frustration and, and sadness, really, that um, I was exasperated that this was our system. We, had a, we have a great um, health system in Australia, but we couldn't give someone who was possibly dying in front of my eyes the uh, urgent care he needed. This is my first time I've seen him laying down with all them drips. I was thinking if he, he would leave us, how would I manage my grandkids and my two youngest boys? I thought they are going to... We're going to lose him. The next morning, he gets wheeled out and put on a plane and taken up to Darwin, where eventually he got a CT scan and, 
uh, it showed a ruptured esophagus. Oh, Borhaf syndrome. He was in intensive care for three weeks in a coma and in and out of surgery for life-saving procedures and eventually ended up on the ward in uh, the general surgical ward in Darwin. I was a bit disheartened by that experience. You know, everyone's doing what they can. The system wasn't working. And then a, a new patient, a new problem comes in and, you know, you, you're back in the swing of things. Three weeks later, I had something good to look forward to. My then girlfriend, Hannah, was flying up to spend a bit of time in Kakadu. Not without its risk of harms. Seen a couple of snakes on the way out here. At the end of that trip, we're driving back to Darwin on the Arnhem Highway, and it was dusk. There was a cricket game that was on Hannah hated cricket and, you know, flat out refused to, to tune that in. Not that it's her fault. So stubborn me, I, you know, was desperate for a score, so I started tuning the, tuning the dial. And I took my eyes off the road just for that moment and I think a wheel might have just hit the gravel and instinctively I looked up and swerved. Pretty soon we're fishtailing on this gravel. We are going at 130 kilometres an hour and I felt really out of control. And then there was a smash and that was, was black. And I lost consciousness at that point. We rolled six times off the road and ended up upside down. Blood was, was pouring everywhere from somewhere in my head. I started assessing my own injuries, sort of self-diagnosed rib fractures and um, maybe a pneumothorax, which is a punctured lung. I was in bad shape. Hannah was desperate to get help. She'd fractured her clavicle and badly bruised her ankle. So she sort of hobbled off into the distance. Hannah went up to the roadway to signal the car to stop. Unfortunately, the first car went past and didn't stop at all. Hannah was uh, very distraught, in fact, beside herself. This other car came and uh, she was definitely on the road trying to hail it down and just whoosh, straight past. Didn't even slow down. Just the, uh, the people going past. You'd think 10 years later you'd be right, wouldn't you? And at that point, yeah, I lost a bit of hope. Dusk was setting in and I was just looking up at the sky, um, struggling to breathe and, and I was just slowly fading away as I reconciled myself to dying. And, uh, and then I slipped into what I thought was my final sleep. Finally, a third car comes past and this car decides to slow down and three Indigenous men hop out. And those are the people who decided to actually stop and help. The Aboriginal men gave me a little bit of a nudge and uh, I woke up and I just, I just remember looking up and he said, uh, you are right, brother? <laughs> I said, no, I'm, I'm dying, I'm dead. And they said, nah, you'll be right, brother. I just took some confidence that maybe I would be all right. And they stayed with me until the rest of the cavalry arrived. Out of my 10 years of working as a remote area nurse was one of the more significant accidents that I had gone to. But it was quite apparent that Tim had a severe laceration to the back of his head. He had several fractured ribs, a fractured shoulder, a bilateral hemoneumothorax. They loaded me into the ambulance and off we went to Jabiru Clinic and, yeah, I never saw those three Aboriginal men again. Within trauma, we talk about a golden hour in which there's a chance to save a life if somebody's been severely injured. Jabiru Traffic, Kenneth White, 26, Miami, 3,500, shortly on the set. 
Tim certainly did risk death if his collapsed lung wasn't treated in a timely manner. I was lucky that I was 300 kilometres north of Catherine and a retrieval plane was able to land after dark um, in the remote reaches of Kakadu. So there was a GP who happened to be at the clinic who wanted to learn about putting a chest tube in. So I asked the GP, can you tell me what the anatomical landmarks are for me to put this chest tube in? And as I said that, Tim piped up, fourth intercostal space in the mid-axillary line. And I had to say, shush, Tim, you're the patient, not the doctor here. It struck me that um, this was the same procedure I'd done on manual three weeks earlier. And it was on the same side of our chest. And um, yeah, here we go again, but uh, the shoe's on the other foot. I went to intensive care and I needed a couple of operations and then I went up to the ward and recovered for a couple of weeks. My surgeon came and said he was presenting a case that might be of interest to me at the Grand Round, which is a meeting of all the surgical disciplines in the hospital. I thought, yeah, I've got nothing else on. <laughs> So I wheel myself down the corridor. So he turned up to the ground round in his patient clothes with bruised eyes. <laughs> Surgical registrar was presenting this case of a 42-year-old Indigenous man who'd presented to Catherine Hospital, diagnosed with uh, Boerhaave syndrome, and uh, a lot of the surgeons said, why was there such a delay getting this man from Catherine? And so I stood up and said, oh, I'll tell you why there was such a delay. And they all turned around and looked at me and who let this guy out of the psych ward? I think there were a few gasps in the room, but he then went on to explain why there was a delay. Their reaction was basically to put measures in to change the current practice at the time. Up until then, I didn't realise that Manuel was just next to me in the surgical ward. So... I went and visited him and, you know, we exchanged our war stories and had a bit of a laugh and I think we both realised we'd come, um, come to the brink and, and come back again. I said to him, I'm not going to drink any more beer because that's not good. You know, I want to stop that. I want to stop the drinking and you, you're going to stop the driving. I said like this, you know, no more fast driving. We did make a pact, like, his drinking had effectively led to him vomiting and causing his esophagus to rupture. Um, and my irresponsible cavalier driving techniques had led to our crash. I felt an incredible guilt and shame. After a very intense period together after the accident, Eventually, Hannah and I went our, our separate ways and there was no animosity. Um, and it's just what happens to people. Being by the side of the road, I did make certain promises that if I did get through this, I felt I would owe it to the world to, to pay it back. Having benefited so much from uh, emergency services, the natural fit was for me to do emergency medicine. I got back to Melbourne and uh, continued my recuperation, but as soon as I could, I applied for the College of Emergency Medicine. Mm, does it smell? Allowing other people to live is a great way to fill your day. So, yeah, I wanted to do that, you know, with gusto now. The Catherine job initially was going to be my last medical job. I thought it was right that it was my first one back. Hello, I'm Tim. I just felt I needed to exercise some demons and um, throw myself back into where it had all started. I was only nine months older, but it seemed a world ago that I'd last been there. A little murmur. Have, the, have any, anyone said you've got a murmur there before? Oh. I had a different perspective. Hello, Lily, I'm Dr Tim. Amongst the new staff at the hospital was a, a Kiwi lad, Jash. He said he'd met this Aboriginal man who, uh, 
who'd been asking after me. He was an artist in residence. He started telling us a story about how he ended up in hospital next to one of the doctors that had treated him, um, and he was trying to find him. I drove down to the, the art centre and went to the front desk, and uh, they said, uh, are you the doctor? And they said, oh, no, c come, come. And as I was going out, I was seeing all this artwork and uh, these awards that were framed and Manuel Pamko, well-renowned artist in the district and, uh, and multi-award winning advocate of the cause, has uh, really turned his life around. By sticking true to the pact and not drinking another drop, he's really made something great of himself. I was just so thrilled and amazed to be there. And he looked at me and me at him and um, it was a very emotional moment. He had that big, broad smile and warmth. He's an extraordinary person. When I stopped that drinking, everything changed for me. When I get up in the morning, I'm good. Happy. Yeah, I'm still strong, you know. I don't go back to drink again, nah. Manuel, before the accident, he was very unreliable because he used to drink. And uh, so I just employed him for what he, what he painted. But now he's playing a very, very uh, important part in, in the whole operation. I do work for tourism, six months and then in the wet season, I do a lot of painting. And I like what I'm doing, you know, because that's my thing. Not only the language, but I learn other things. I'm still strong with my culture. But I think it's very important to pass it on the stories, the song, everything. Our kids are all proud of him, too. I love the way that he, he, he's, he keep working, never stop. A lot of the experience I had with Manuel drove me to wanting to tell the story. And I thought the best way of doing this was to write a film. I had this skill now as well, and so I put my mind to writing a script, and of that came Aboriginal Heart. Hi, Doctor. If you're going to cast yourself in a film, you want someone a bit bigger, stronger, better looking to play you. <laughs> oh, that's just a faulty monitor. He's fine. So Adam, Adam was the man for the job. Is this monitor accurate? Reasonably. It was good to have <laughs> Tim on set because I had no idea what I was doing in those uh, medical scenes, that's for sure. We just finished editing it and it got picked up by Sydney Film Festival. Uh, soon after that, London Film Festival. It went on to Italian TV as well as the ABC for a time. While I love filmmaking, I knew that the most useful I could be was to retrieve people um, in dire need of medical attention. All right, here we go for a job in uh, somewhere in the Northern Territory. And three years ago, I joined the Flying Doctors in uh, northwest Queensland. A lady with chest pain uh, since last night. Could be the heart, could be the stomach. I'd realised how critically for me, I was able to get help and assistance um, in a very remote place where I was stranded. Then it's great. It's only 43 degrees today, so just the right temperature to go flying. All right, let's go. 50, 40, 30, 10. You don't know what's going to come in. And you've got to be ready for, for anything. And it's hard, but exciting and worthwhile. I've decided that I can't worry because he's in little planes flying around. Safe travels. I can't worry because he's doing what he wants to do. Just giving you an ETA for um, when we're getting into uh, the tarmac, 1300. I feel a lot more comfortable now than I did 10 years ago. It's good to know you can confidently 
provide a top class service in remote country places. We've got a 33 year old Aboriginal man with abdominal pain who's presented to Mornington Hospital. I think Tim still likes quite a bit of excitement in his life. Despite not wanting to follow in my father's footsteps precisely, uh, they're pretty good footsteps. Just tell me if it's painful when I lift up. Yeah. Very good. Just have to listen to your heart there. When I'm not working with the flying doctors, I love going back to uh, these remote areas to do locum work. Hello there, Cheryl. And is this Timmy? It's really pleasing, uh, heartwarming to go back to Catherine now and see the changes that have been made since then. Mind if I make him the driver? Oh. I'm really grateful that this experience of manuals and mine has contributed to these changes. You can drive one handed again, yeah? And this was one of those cases that really uh, propagated the change and others may have been saved. So since that time, you know, when Manuel was a, a patient with us, we now are able to transfer patients at night. And we've also increased the amount of senior staff that we have here at the hospital. Oh, we'll need the ultrasound, we'll need to do a fast scan. Sure. Can you see us on the screen? This is a 32-year-old gentleman with a multi-trauma. Could we activate the massive transfusion protocol? We've got a trauma camera so that we can link in now to any of the uh, specialists in Darwin. Head injury as well. And they can give us advice minute by minute as to what we need to do or anything that we might have missed, and that's fantastic. Regrettably, my times in Catherine are rare, but invariably very special. Yeah, how are you? I'm all right, good to see you. Yeah. Give us a hug. Oh, it's great long to see Long camera's you. here. Always too long. Long, you're a long way, I'm a long way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you like the heat, I'm not so good. Sometimes we, uh, particularly doctors, think, oh, we know it all. We're, we're here to give um, people advice on, on health and life and how to live. Um, but sometimes, in fact, often, uh, there's lessons to be learnt from your patients. And, um, and sometimes your patients can become friends and, uh, and teach you those things. Jessica, Jessica right. good to see you again. To me, it's like my brother, you know. All right. He's, he's really a good friend of mine. Tim, lovely to meet you. Manuel found the guy that, that he identified as saving his life, but I don't feel like the whole story's complete until I can find the three Aboriginal men who saved me. No one really understands until you're in that situation what it's like to have your life saved. I don't think they ever realise what a difference that made to me. I mean, it's, it's nothing too fancy or complex. I just want to say thanks, guys. Thanks, mate. Like, that uh, <laughs> didn't change my life. It, it's, that act saved my life. And it's been a while, but it's something I've, I think about every day. It's hard to go searching for people that I only caught a glimpse of. I've got really nothing to go on. I don't have any names, but I'm eternally grateful. I was born inside a humpy like this. You were born in a humpy like this? Inside, yeah. Wow. Over time, we talked about um, making a film about the whole, uh, the whole event. I like to be an actor because I'm not too shy. You know, I, I can sing, I can tell stories. You never know, I become a good, good actor. <laughs> yeah, I think that would be ideal, but still waiting for Hollywood to knock on the doors.